In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let me bring you to the year of the Lord, 390. In the city of Thessalonica, in Greece, a certain man was denounced for committing a crime and was placed in prison. But the people wanted his liberty. It seems they liked very much his skills as a charioteer. But the governor was not moved by the request of the people, and he refused to free the men. So the people started a riot, and during that riot, they killed the governor and released the charioteer. Some days after this incident, all the city gathered together for what they thought to be a charity race. But in fact, it was a trap. The imperial troops wanted to punish the people for what they had done to the governor. So they trapped everyone inside the hippodrome and slaughtered about 7,000 people, including women and the children. This is known as the massacre of Thessalonica. The emperor at that time was Theodosius. Theodosius was the one who some years before had made the Catholic, the Catholic religion the official religion of the empire. So here we are, we are talking about a Catholic emperor. About the massacre, some historians dispute if he ordered it, or if he simply allowed it to happen. In any case, the emperor knew of it beforehand and he gave his consent. When the news of the massacre came to the ears of St. Ambrose, who was the Bishop of Milan, where the imperial court was located, he was profoundly disturbed by the action of the emperor. How could he have ordered or simply allowed this indiscriminate slaughter in which innocent people who had nothing to do with the death of the governor were killed. St. Ambrose knew that the action of the emperor was a public sin and it required a public penance. And he, as the bishop, had not only the right, but the duty to order the emperor to repent and to make reparation for the public scandal he had given. And so, when Theodosius came to the cathedral of Milan in order to attend Mass, after the massacre, St. Ambrose placed himself at the door of the church and forbade the emperor to come in. He didn't allow Theodosius even to enter the holy place, but he ordered him publicly to repent and to do penance. Just imagine it, the bishop preventing the Roman emperor, the most powerful man on earth, to enter the church.
Now, looking at what St. Ambrose did to the emperor, one might say that the bishop lacked pastoral dimension. Because how could, be, how could he be so mean to the emperor? To the point of forbidding him to enter the church. St. Ambrose, he knew very well that by calling out the sin of the emperor, he was risking his own peace. And in a certain way, the peace of the entire church in the empire. What if, in response, Theodosius started a persecution? I'm sure that St. Ambrose had some fear of what Theodosius could do. But above the fear of men, the holy bishop had in his heart the fear of God. And this is what gave him courage to do what he had to do. He knew he was not made a bishop to have an easy and comfortable life. He knew he was not made a bishop to be ashamed of the truth, which equals to be ashamed of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the truth. St. Ambrose knew that the truth is not to be concealed, but to be proclaimed, even if the outcome is persecution. St. Ambrose acted out of love for the truth, but also out of charity, true charity, because he cared about the eternal salvation of the soul of the emperor. And that's why he did what he did. Like a physician who reveals the sickness to the patient and prescribes the treatment, St. Ambrose denounced the sin of the emperor to his face, deprived him of Holy Communion, and ordered him to do penance. Why? because he cared about the eternal salvation of the soul of the emperor. Now, Theodosius was not happy at all with the reprimand of his bishop, a public reprimand. However, thanks to that reprimand, the emperor came to acknowledge his sin and humbly submitted himself to the penance imposed by the church. And after some months of public penance, Theodosius was once again admitted to Holy Communion. And a few years later, he died a holy death. My brethren, the emperor's soul was saved because of the true pastoral dimension of his bishop, because of the true charity of his bishop, who dared to do his duty and to admonish the sinner. But why do I speak about that to you? Because, my brethren, we have similar things going on today. Many politicians in this country who call themselves Catholics are guilty of a slaughter worse than the one of Thessalonica. 
In that massacre, 7,000 people were killed. But in the great massacre of our days called abortion, only in this country, we have about 12,000, 12,000 innocent babies killed every single week. Around 50,000 a month. More than 600,000 a year. Only in this country. Many people invested with authority have not only consented to the evil of abortion by not doing anything in order to eradicate this plague from society, but they have even promoted abortion with their words, with their actions, with their laws. They try to justify abortion, but the truth is that a procured abortion, a direct abortion, can never be justified. It's always gravely sinful because it is the deliberate killing of an innocent human being. And this is the teaching of the church based upon the natural law, but also upon the word of God. This is what the church has always taught and teaches. So if someone would refuse to accept this truth, which means if someone would obstinately deny or doubt the truth about the intrinsic evil of abortion, this person would be this person would be placing himself outside of the communion of the church because he would be rejecting a truth of our faith. That's why there can be no such a thing as a pro-abortion Catholic. Either you are pro-abortion or you are Catholic. These two things cannot go together because one excludes the other. So no Catholic can be pro-abortion. But for politicians declaring oneself pro-abortion or working to promote abortion, in any way, is not only a grave sin, but also a public scandal. It is public and not simply a matter of conscience left to each one to decide. No. But the public sinner must be admonished by the church authorities. And if he chooses to persevere in his evil ways, he must be denied Holy Communion. And this is not me, but the right thing to do. It is, in fact, the only thing to do. And this is a charitable because we care about the eternal salvation of the soul. Letting someone receive the Most Holy Eucharist in a state of public grave sin constitutes a sacrilege not only for the one who receives the sacrament, but also for the one who knowingly gives it. Any priest, bishop, and even the Pope, anyone, is forbidden by divine law to allow public sinners who persevere in their sins to receive Holy Communion. And this question is not negotiable. But today, 
we hear the opposite. How many false prophets, how many preachers of a false mercy, which does not require repentance, a mercy that does not require conversion. They do exactly the opposite of what St. Ambrose did. Instead of admonishing the public sinner as true shepherds of God, they remain silent and pretend nothing's wrong. False prophets of a false mercy. My brethren, it constitutes a grave scandal in the church today when pro-abortion politicians are admitted to Holy Communion. And many do so under the gaze of their bishops. Just imagine if St. Ambrose had not confronted the emperor and denounced his sin. Imagine if he didn't care and simply let Theodosius to approach Holy Communion with that public grave sin on his soul. Imagine what would have happened. I tell you what would have happened. Theodosius would be now in hell together with his bishop. So, my brethren, we must pray. Pray that all priests, but especially the bishops and the Pope himself, will follow the example of St. Ambrose and have in their hearts the fear of God above the fear of men. We pray that they will have the courage to do their duty and to admonish the politicians who promote the massacre of abortion or other policies which go against the law of God. Let them not be afraid of men, but afraid of the one who will come to judge them on the last day. So let the pastors admonish the public sinners as St. Ambrose did with Theodosius. And let the so-called Catholic politicians who promote abortion have the humility to imitate that great emperor and acknowledge their sins and do penance. And then, only then, once they have confessed their sins and made public penance for the scandal they have caused, they may be admitted to Holy Communion. Not before. Period. So I thought necessary to make this matter clear to you all. So when we hear about what is going on today, we know what is right and what is wrong. Remember, right is right and wrong is wrong, no matter who does it. So let us not lose hope in these times of confusion in the world and in the church. The devil wants us to be discouraged in seeing all the craziness that is going on. But let us not give up hope. Let us persevere in our good works. They are not useless. But let us persevere in our good works. And above all, let us understand that in order to do our part in overcoming all the evil in the world, we should, first of all, 
to look for the conversion of our own hearts. That's where it must start. We have to remove sin from our lives and look for holiness. That's where we start. Before trying to reform the others, we know we should start with ourselves. But what about those who promote evil? My brethren, let us not hate them. Let's not hate them because hate is not part of our faith. Let us remember that Christ our Lord shed his blood for each one of them as well. So let us pray for them that they may convert and come to have eternal life. So let us pray for those who promote evil that they may convert before it is too late. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Thank you for listening. Please remember to click subscribe and to hit the bell for notifications. And in this age of censorship, please consider helping support us at sensefidelium.com. Under the Donate and Support tab, there are plenty of ways to help support the work and to help grow and sustain the efforts of Census Fidelium in general. May God reward you, and thank you very much.